Dr. Sarah Hart Unger is a pediatric endocrinologist who did all of her education at Duke and is now the Pediatric Residency Program Director at Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital in South Florida. She's intrigued by the challenges of making work and life fit together, so much so that she co-hosts a podcast on the topic, Best of Both Worlds, with time management expert and writer Laura Vanderkam. She's married to a vascular surgeon and has three young kids. So we discuss how they manage to get it all done using the getting things done, or GTD, methodology. We talk about how checklists aren't just critical in central line placement, and she has her own checklist manifesto to get your day, your month, and your life more organized. She has some favorite apps, although she finds paper keeps her more organized. She then tries to help me get organized so I don't end up distracted and thinking about all the things that I need to do while I'm playing with my kids, and then tries to convince me to clean up my desk. In addition to her podcast, you can find her at theshoebox.com, shoe spelled S-H-U. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee, and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Shopping for disability insurance can be complicated and time-consuming. Wondering if you're getting the best prices and discounts while in training can make the process even more overwhelming. Pattern believes doctors have more important things to do than spending hours sorting through numerous insurance options. This is why thousands of doctors trust Pattern to help them compare and understand the insurances that they are buying. They do this in three simple steps. First, request your quotes online. Second, compare your options and ask questions. And third, apply risk-free. Be confident you have the right policy so that your income is protected. With discounts for doctors in training and some relaxed requirements during the pandemic, Now is truly the best time to request your disability insurance quotes with Pattern at PatternLife.com slash partner slash PGD. Again, that's PatternLife.com slash partner slash PGD for Physician's Guide to Doctoring. Sarah Hart Unger, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. So tell us your origin story. How did you end up becoming an organizer extraordinaire and turn that into a blog and a podcast? Or was it yeah. writing the blog that turned you into the expert, like what, chicken to the egg? What? How did that work? How did that happen? Well, first of all, I don't know if I can fully call myself an official. I'm sort of like an amateur organization expert. It's something that I love. I've actually been blogging since 2004, which is really before most people were blogging. Um, yes. there, was, there was a physician blogger named Michelle O. Oh. She was an anesthesiologist and she wrote a fantastic blog called The Underwear Drawer. And I was very much inspired by her to start my blog like 15 years ago, 16 now actually. And it initially was just about, you know, life. I was a med student at the time. I did a lot of whining and then, you know, it evolved. And at one point it was more of a fitness blog. And at one point it was more of a parenting blog. But one theme that I've always found sort of like a big key to life is how to organize and how to plan ahead and how that seems to be kind of the key thread in my life that's helped me A, succeed and B, enjoy my life while doing it. So I feel like I have pivoted more and more in that direction. And then I also find that my readers have been the most responsive to the things I've written around organizing, probably because it was just a space that was a little bit less oversaturated. I used to post pictures of like my page and my planner and I would notice that that was what was, you know, shared and Jillian times on Pinterest, whereas my poorly photographed culinary concoctions really didn't get any attention. Hmm, I wonder why. So yeah, I think it was like the demand and my interest. And then the podcast kind of grew out of the blog. And my podcast is done with Laura Vanderkam, which if you are a reader, you may know that name because she has written several books on time management. In 2009, she wrote one called 168 Hours, which is all about you know fitting everything you can into, an, into a week and succeeding and enjoying life while doing it. And I loved it. So I Googled her, of course, found her blog started commenting on her blog. And then she seemed to start commenting on my blog, which at first was like thrilling, starstruck this author. But then we kind of became online friends, ended up meeting up in person because she lives in Philadelphia and I'm from there. And we were visiting my family 
And then the idea kind of hatched that maybe we could do a podcast together on making work and life fit together. And then one of the main themes in that podcast tends to be that in order to make work and life fit together as a busy professional and one with a family, it seems to always come back to organizing. So I guess that's my roundabout way of saying it kind of evolved organically, but it happens to be something that I am quite passionate about. Right. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. You're going to help me get organized. You're going to, we're going to talk about how you, you got your... You helped your husband to get organized, and we're going to help all of our listeners to get organized. Well, I hope so. (laughs) Okay. So can you elaborate on that a little more? So one thing that you mentioned to me previously is is you don't really consider your work and personal lives as being separate and distinct, right? Which to me, I completely compartmentalize the two, right? I might email my wife from work or call my wife from work, but like, that's kind of... It. Otherwise, they're completely separate, or maybe like call a patient back from home, right? Fine. But you're, you, you're kind of, they're, they're all one entity to you. What does that even mean? And how does that help you to make it work? Yeah. So, I mean, it's true. I, I'm not saying like, oh, I talk to my kids while I'm seeing my patients. Like, obviously, as I'm functioning throughout my days, I have to be focused on one versus the other. But I think it's very, very important to take a holistic view of number one, what you want to accomplish. And number two, really having some kind of hard landscape, whether that's online or on paper, about how that is going to fit together. And usually for any given week, I have six or seven big things I want to accomplish. And some of them may be personal and some of them may be work, but I think they all belong on this weekly list. And when I'm creating my list of what I want to do for a day or I'm putting that together, I have to take what my work is very much into account when I'm creating that. If I know I have a really heavy patient load, I probably can't plan to get some personal things done in the lunch hour. Or if I am more flexible, maybe I'll know that I can go and pick up one of my kids early. Like it, it really does one very much influences the other. So I use a paper planner to put it all together. I think other people really swear by electronic resources like Google Calendar or other online calendars. But I think that people who completely separate the two are probably lying to themselves a little bit because one is going to influence the other whether you want them to or not. I mean, there's a little bit of a gender bias to this. Um, I think 30 years ago, there were men who were like, nope, actually, no, I do not ever think about my home life when I'm at work and I have the privilege of having some stay-at-home partner who's managing everything. But today, that's not how most of us are going about living our lives. So I think there has to be an admission that we've got to look at things as a whole and so, yeah, I, I definitely don't consider them separate parts of my life. And when I'm creating goals, I create goals for both personal and work at the same time. Okay. So I think it's in terms of your organization, right? You've got your list of things to do and your list of things to do is not compartmentalized by work and home. And it's, it's organized by probably priority and those, Time frame. Yes. yeah, those are going to overlap. So um, you're, you, you can't really just right. If it was 30 years ago, I might be able to, well, I need to get all my work stuff done. And when my work stuff done, then I can go home and see the kids, but that's not how my life works either. And so <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, yeah. And I think that's, you know, men may, may have mourned that for a while, but I think also men have have realized that they missed out by not being kind of that active participant and family manager. So I know my husband has definitely thinks about both spheres as very important. And I, I don't think he'd have it any other way, even though he's very busy. One thing that I'm trying to get better at when I'm with my kids is not thinking about work, right? So like everyone says, and this is Oh, this kills me. Every time someone's, oh, it goes so fast. It goes so, right, fine, thank you. That was very helpful advice. Thank you for being this thousandth person to tell me that it goes fast, right? Days are long, nights are short, or or days are long, years are short, whatever, fine. But I think one way to make it, to slow it down is to be present. And so something that I'm really trying to get better at is not thinking about work while I'm playing with my kids, not having that on my brain. And so then I can be more, you know, more present, more engaged, more involved, and it actually slows time down a bit. So, And those two things absolutely go hand in hand because the only way that we can be fully present on our task, whether that's a work life or a home life, is to know that everything in the world that you have to think about has been reliably captured somewhere so that you kind of know you can be doing that one thing. And that's actually, I'm, I'm skipping ahead in what I told you I wanted to discuss, but you know that I got that from getting things done, which is uh, David Allen's methodology, you know, over a decade ago. 
but he talks about something called mind like water, which is when you're fully focused and immersed on one thing and you're flowing on that one thing and not flitting from thing to thing that you have to do. And the only way you can get to that space, whether it's in seeing patients and seeing them and then writing the notes immediately after and, and really practicing efficiently or it's hanging out with your toddler on the floor is by having all those loose ends captured reliably so that you can do that without wondering, oh my God, am I missing something? Yeah, and my wife will tell you that I start to decompensate when the stuff that I have to get done by a certain date is starting to accrue and I don't have time to get it all done. Or maybe I do and I don't realize it, then I'm distracted. It affects my mood and it affects my ability to engage with them. So, you know, clearly. I need your help. <laughs> yes. Well, it sounds like what you need is to look a little bit harder at your time horizons and to really create a plan, especially when you do have those things coming up. I mean, there are times that you're going to have a deadline and are going to have to be more work focused. And that might mean blocking out on the weekend before, hey, uh, family, I'm going to be totally present with you guys until 3 p.m. And then I need three hours to disappear and you guys will go on an outing and I'll meet you for dinner. Um, but the only way you're going to know to do that is if you've really thought ahead of the time about, about what you need. Or maybe you're going to carve out time in the morning. I mean, I don't know what your particular solution is going to be, but I do think that actually thinking through how long things actually take, making sure that the things you've committed to are priorities for you, and then logistically like blocking them in either, again, online, electronically, or on paper will probably help you from, from going so crazy uh, in those moments. Sounds like you have a system. <laughs> I definitely have a system. And my system may not be for everyone, although I will brag that I think it's adaptable for a lot of different people. We are a two-physician household. My husband is a vascular surgeon, and we have three children, two, six, and eight, and we're pretty busy, as you might <laughs> imagine. My husband is a little bit less naturally organized than I am, but even he has adapted several aspects of my system. And I think he feels a little bit better um, as a result. I think this is this can all be learned, right? Like some people have it naturally, but I, I tend to think that like my two-year-old, right? He's funny. So he gets a rise out of someone whenever he, you know, he makes them laugh. And so I think what's going to happen with him over time is he's going to kind of realize what he does that makes people laugh versus not make people laugh. And it's going to make it seem like he was born this way. Whereas he wasn't born this way, he just got some positive reinforcement very early on and it helped to mold him and shape him. So you probably got some reinforcement early on about being organized and it, it worked for you and it, it you know, is this positive reinforcement. So I think we all have the ability to get organized. It just needs to be from an internal impulse, not an external impulse. Like it's, I realize it is time for me. So this stops happening, right? Where I get stressed out around, around my family and bring work stuff home that I get it together. So I think we all, for all the listeners, you can get organized. You just have to be motivated enough to do so. And it's probably little by little rather than turning your whole world upside down. I know there are definitely people that are more, maybe are naturally more organized. I don't even know if I'm one of them. I actually had an incident when I was like nine years old and my teacher dumped my desk out in the hallway because it was so messy. So there you go. Maybe that was the negative that feedback might have that, been, yeah. that brought me to where I am today. Um, but I definitely think many of these things are skills that A, can be learned and that B, will likely bring you some positive feedback in both your own peace of mind and your productivity so that you're probably going to be likely to, to stick with some of them. At least I think I've seen that in my husband. So my so, end of one. <laughs> so do you want to start with a, a micro level, like how you organize your day and then extend to your year and your life goals? Or do you want to start with the more macro and start gonna, with life goals and work it way, work our way to micro? I would go macro because, and actually it's interesting because I was like, you know, once you are organized, it can be kind of hard to see how you got there. But I did recently, honestly, out to dinner with my husband, have this date where I was like, we're going to fix your life. And what we did and what, what I kind of did, but at a much, okay. mine was over a much longer <laughs> frame of time was I did, we just took like every single loose end and we wrote them down on a piece of paper. And this is again, similar to what getting things done tells you to do. They tell you to basically collect every single input out there. So that's like scraps of paper, bills to pay, like envelopes, notes that you have somewhere, emails, every single email could be a thing to do. I mean, we know many of us have like tens of thousands of those, depending on what your style is. You collect everything. And then, you know, in my husband's case, we didn't collect everything, everything, but we kind of collected everything that he could think of. And he also had some really kind of haphazard lists that were, that had no rhyme or reason to them, but we used them as, as like, okay, well, you have this on the list. What does that mean? What does SBS mean? Oh, it means I need to sign up for this conference. Okay. So I'll turn it into sign oh, up for this conference. It sounds to me like something, because he's a vascular surgeon. SBS sounds like something yeah, cardiac just, related. Oh, the no, patient it's is actually, a, he's in SBS right now. 
No, it's Society for Vascular Surgery. It was like a meeting, but yes, it could have been. Anyway, so we took this kind of broad list of stuff, okay? And then I was like, okay, now obviously some of this can just be stuff for the future. It can be for the nebulous future because it's not urgent. Some of it is like stuff that you need to do in the next quarter. And then let's start with the next, let's start with the year, the quarter and future. So we divided it into three lists. We put the future stuff that was like, you know what, maybe you'll get around to that, but we don't need to have a defined time horizon onto a someday maybe list, which is also a concept from David Allen. We put things that we thought that he should do within the year on the year list. And then we took things that were a little bit more urgent and put them on a like quarters or less list. And then once we had those three lists, we took the quarter list and we said, okay, of this quarters list, what are things that you would like to get done this month? And this was like right around January 1st. So we were like, okay, now we have a January list. And it was amazing because this giant list of haphazard stuff was then brought down to like 12 things in four different areas. He wanted to do this much running to train for something. He wanted to submit this paper. He wanted to sign up for this conference. Like it was much, it was so much more manageable. And I think he could see that um, instantly. And he said he felt a lot better and it's been a, you know, a month since then. And he's been checking a lot of things off and he was able to create a February list. So I think, I mean, that sounds so simplistic, but it is similar to how I do things. I have a giant yearly list. I pull quarterly goals from the yearly goals. I pull monthly goals from the quarterly goals. And then every week I pick from that monthly list and also add kind of those day-to-day things that come up on my week. And then as I go about planning my day and I do plan my day very intentionally every day, every morning, I figure out what from the week I can get done during that day. And that's also going to be you know influenced by what's going on in my schedule. Patient load wise, is it a GME day where I'm focused on stuff for a residency program? Or is it a day like today when I'm off and just recording podcasts? So you have separate lists or is there some master list? I actually have separate lists. Um, There are many people that do it differently. So a lot of people just have like a bunch of like notes saved on their phone or it could be my husband also actually did transfer his to paper because he saw the beauty of that. So he has a giant list that's like on his computer, but when he's Mm -hmm. deciding what he's going to put on the quarter list or the month list, he knows that has to be limited. He knows there can't be 600 things on the month list. So he puts that on a piece of paper because it's kind of nice to see like, oh, these are the things I need to get done this month. I can see them all on one page. And you can even hang that up like in your wall so you know what, what your focuses are. So I think that's been really helpful. But yes, I do have separate. I use a planner system called a Hobonichi, which is a Japanese planner that has a page for every single day. And it sounds like it's gigantic, but it's actually really, really thin paper. So it's fairly portable. That sounds like cheating. It's thin. I know. It's thin paper. It's 365 pages, but they're thin pages. So it doesn't look that big. It's true. It doesn't look that huge. And then I even have, actually, since we have video, I can show it to you right here, even though I know the listeners won't be able to see it. This little like tiny, I mean, it's like, you know, very thin accessory notebook. This has every single quarterly and monthly list for 2020. And then I can throw it out at the end of the year and it's gone. But it's a very useful tool because I think a lot of people- I'm not going to keep it. No, probably not. you have to testify before the Supreme Court about what you were doing one day? (laughs) My blog can be used for that. (laughs) 30 years ago? Oh, okay. No, I I think part of the beauty is of written stuff is that you can't put 9,000 things on it. Like no one's going to sit there and, you know, fill 90 pages with their month's goals. So you're forced to actually call your goals to what a reasonable number of things to do because our time is finite. We have to choose. So when you're making your list, does it involve your husband? Some of the things do and some of them don't. Like um, if I'm just figuring out like what I have to do for the week, no, that doesn't. I mean, we try to, uh, well, actually that's a digression. So there's something called a weekly review, which is also a David Allen concept, which is like, do you have a ritual of things you do at the end of each week to kind of get you ready for the next week? And I do, although he kind of suggests that people do this on Friday and I tend to do it on Sunday. And as part of my weekly review, I have actually- Well, there's some on- religions where the Sabbath is on Friday and some religions it's on Sunday and some religions it's on Saturday. Saturday. So I think you, this is that, kind that, of like yeah. my religion. So there you, there you go. No. So on Sundays, I kind of look at the next week's landscape and think about like what nights I might have to work late or, you know, who's going to take the kids to school, what days. And that's when we always tend to look at things together or we'll say, oh, you remember we have like a date night on Saturday and I got the babysitter and the ticket. Like I tend to be the planner of the family as you might anticipate, but sometimes he needs to be reminded of some of those plans. Yes. I uh, actually, we had an incident recently, not an incident, where she, I gave her the access to my Calendly app, which is how I organize who's going to be on my podcast. And so that she knows what days, like 
you know, on Thursday, we're doing this on a Thursday afternoon. There are some Thursdays that I take it as an admin day. It's where I do like a lot of my CME stuff or patient callbacks and podcast interviews. Uh, so she knows if I'm going to be around or not. And, um, and she thought I had an interview two nights ago because I had, but someone canceled. But she has to, because she doesn't get that email that it canceled. She thought I had an interview at night. So, you know, in case one of the kids woke up, I wasn't going to be available. So, you know, we have to find a way to make that work. And I don't know, are there apps out there, like a calendar app where she can, but like that integrates with, that, that communicates. Like yeah. I need her, I, I, mean, I we, need to know when her dentist appointment is. And yet when she tells me it, I don't put it in my calendar. I should but I don't like, so is there a way to just have that so that they overlap? Yeah. So a lot of people do a shared Google calendar for that reason. And then you can just, yeah, absolutely. And with Google, you can just like subscribe to, you know, you can subscribe to your work calendar. You can, you can get an invite to subscribe to somebody else's calendar. So, and my husband and I actually do use Google calendar together, not for, not for everything, but we'll use it for like, okay, well actually I don't really use it, but he uses it. So if I get invited, if basically if I want to put anything on my schedule that could potentially affect him, I try to send it to him as an invite through Google calendar. And then he can see it on his phone and, and I can see it as well. I mean, you could also consider, you could have like a family email account that is shared that you can both log into. And then you could basically have a calendar associated with that account and then just put that calendar on both of your phones. And then either of you could add to that one at any time, and either of you could see it. So you could do that. But yeah, electronic calendars are fantastic for that. I know other families like the COZI app, Cozy, because it can be also used for kind of family task management and stuff. I have never tried it, so I can't personally vouch, but that's that's another system I've heard a lot of people use. Yeah, I, I think we are definitely going to switch to the to the Google. We're gonna I'm gonna have to invite her. I could see where it's some it wouldn't work with some people where your your off your business thrives on meetings. So you got tons of meetings. So they're, then, then your partner's calendar is going to be cluttered with all of your business meetings. You know, in our profession, that's basically the entire profession is meetings. So that's not going on our Google calendar, right? Because it's just patient visit after patient visit. Yes. But, but if you were in, a, in a, another profession, I could see where that, that could be problematic. But our listeners are physicians. So I think, I think that's really going to work for, for, for most of us. It's interesting. You brought up the getting things done and the check methodology, David Allen and there's also a tool Gawande's the checklist manifesto. So we are no strangers to checklists, yet, you know, we might be resistant to integrating them or maybe even didn't see that you right when you're doing a central line to minimize the risk of infection, you have a checklist. Well, you know what, when getting your You day, can actually apply a lot of checklists to your life management and I love a tool Gawande's checklist manifesto and I think we don't use enough checklists in our lives. So actually again, since I have this visual aid that none of our listeners can see unfortunately, I will show you that I actually have in here Oh, I don't know if you can see. I have a list of what should be happening in my weekly review. Like these are the things, if I do all these things, life will run smoothly. So for example, for my weekly review, I look at my goals lists. It actually says review goals lists, monthly goals, and upcoming calendar, migrate or eliminate prior week's tasks, add new items for monthly lists or projects or if needed, empty physical inboxes, work and home, empty virtual inboxes. And yes, I subscribe to inbox zero as well. Um, plan the week's workouts and meals and then review the plan with Josh and our nanny. So like, and is that I know every, that's, that's every week though. That is like, a weekly that's the review. same thing that comes, that comes up. Oh, so that's on every page of that no, nope, that's just in there once. It's just in there once for me to refer to of like, these are the things that oh, like did I do at the all end of, of the things? week, I really need to do those things to make sure I have a successful next week. And then I also have one for the month that's right under that. And then I also have one for the quintile. Now I made these all pretty in part because I had a blog and I wanted to share them with my readers and post them to Instagram. I don't know if it yeah. had to, has to be this fancy, but it actually does help to have a list for these, these run of the mill kind of like life organization things so that you, you know, you don't miss something and you can have peace of mind. And when you know, you're on I've been, the carpet with your two-year-old. <laughs> I've been thinking about, we've been trying to say, all right, we're going to have a family meeting every Sunday, right? Where we just debrief about the, the, the previous week and then talk about what's going to come up in the upcoming week. But we never have an agenda. So the meeting never happens and it just never come, came to fruition. But it seems like that is a great way to it basically sets the agenda for the meeting. And then you have to have the meeting because you've got this list of things that you need to go through. And also it's important to make sure that you and your partner are on, are on the same page. And that's where 
for us, because my wife's a stay-at-home mom, we have three kids, the oldest of which is almost four, the youngest of which is five months. So they're, they're separated by three years and four months, three, three kids separated by three years and four months. So they're, they're really close together and they're all really young. Uh, so she's at home right now. Um, which, which is great for me because then, but when I'm at work, I'm seeing patients and I'm at home with the family, but there's all this stuff that needs to get done in between. And I feel like anytime I need to get it done, I'm almost like asking a favor from her because then which you are because she's, she's, free. yeah. I mean, putting myself in her shoes like that is really hard. And then I know how it is even with my husband and we both work where if he's like, Oh, I have to go in and see a patient when he wasn't on call. I'm like, Oh, knife through yeah. the heart. Now I've got yeah. all three kids. Like, but somehow when I know about it ahead of time and I know that he has to work, it is less of a knife through the heart somehow. So I, I do think it might help that dynamic because I kind of can glean what it would be like. And maybe it would even help like if you know that you have a presentation you're giving on a Monday that's like three weeks from now and you know the only time you're going to have to do it is to cram it on that Sunday, like maybe she could get a babysitter to help her for a couple of hours. Like that kind of advanced planning could help both of you and help her. Or maybe she'll say that she doesn't need that, but at least she knew about she it. Knows. You know? She knows. Yeah. It wasn't It wasn't a surprise. And it, you're not waiting for me to blow my stack because I'm getting so stressed out because I haven't found the time to organize this presentation. And Because you just yeah. had it like as a nagging thought was, in your mind. Yeah. You didn't have like the plan for how you were going to deal with it written down anywhere or like integrated in, into your, your time. Um, you become I, my I, marriage I, therapist. Did you, do you realize I that just it. happened? I know. It's going to be my, it could be my, my side expertise. Your side gig. <laughs> I think the reason I like all this is because I am a naturally anxious person and I just can't stand like exactly like I'm getting like secondhand itchiness thinking about, you know, your presentation and your three <laughs> kids and your wife and whatever. So for me, when I run into those situations, I've figured out pretty early on, I guess that's the negative feedback. Like if I have a plan for this, or if it's something like, you know, when you're a med student and you're studying for, for one of the steps, like it's this huge thing, but if you break it down and you create a plan for it, it's so much less scary. It's so much less anxiety provoking. And honestly, you'll probably do a better job yeah. with the task itself. Yeah. Cause then you can be absorbed in it rather than being distracted by the fact that now I know my wife's upset with me because she's responsible for three kids and it came as a surprise. And yeah. Yes. Okay. So something else that we talked about before the show is the importance of having a clean work area. So one thing <laughs> That, that infuriates my wife about me is that my screen is always dirty. My computer screen is dirty. My phone screen is dirty. What? You know, I, I can read it just fine. Okay. Well, my, my desk, but my desk at work also not so organized. I mean, we're on the electronic medical record because so most of those papers are really of zero consequence. I just didn't take the time to organize them until what can go into the HIPAA trash and what can go into the regular trash. So you were going to convince me why I should clean that area up. Is it bad that I just throw everything into the HIPAA trash? I'm probably wasting money by doing that. <laughs> okay. Like, like if yeah. I have a journal, I'm like, eh, just throw it in the bin. Like uh, our, our office is not very good about, well, there's, okay. Anyway, um, <laughs> but there is a little bit of- You're so a the monster. Irony, I know I'm a monster. <laughs> so the irony is that I'm sitting in this room, which is my husband's office, and it is like a full-on mess because there are some things where you just- you just don't mess with somebody else's MO. Pick your battles. <laughs> pick your battles. Exactly. So I guess I have no idea if my phone, my husband's phone screen is dirty. And if it doesn't bother him, that's fine. But there has been at least some evidence to suggest that a cleaner workspace can actually lead to greater productivity. I, I read that in um, one of Julie. I mean, who knows? Maybe it comes from biased sources. Like if I'm reading organizing books and it says that, like, you know, where does this evidence come from? Randomized <laughs> trials, like a exactly. sham controlled. It's not actually messy. For it people that messy. read organizing books, no, yeah. Gretchen Rubin wrote a book called Outer Order Intercom, which is also not entirely evidence-based. There's a lot of cute anecdotes in it. I enjoy it. But I think there there's at least some suggestion that having a clean workspace for some individuals can improve their productivity. I am one of them. If I have a bunch of crap all around me, it's it sort of like ruins my ability to think completely linearly and I will notice it. That oddly does not apply to doing podcasts in my husband's office because I think I'm completely desensitized, but I think it's more about the loose ends, honestly. So if I'm in my office, the papers don't bother me because they're not pretty. They bother me because I'm like, oh God, is this something I have to do? And then it's like, 
an undefined input. It's an undefined to-do. I need to get that in my queue, figure out if this is something I need to do today or can wait or where it needs to go. Because otherwise, I'm just, my eyes are going to go to it and like, I'm going to be distracted by the idea that like, oh, is this someone's home health, health paperwork that I need to sign? Is this like a resident evaluation? Like, I don't even know what it is. So from that perspective, I think, I think if it doesn't bother you, I wouldn't argue with it. But at the same time, if you're ever distracted by the idea that some of that stuff could be important, it probably is a good idea to figure out a time when you can process that. Now, I don't think it needs to be every day. So my co-host, Laura Vanderkam, the time management expert, I call her the guru. She laughs at my inbox zero. She's like, my inbox has like 9 jillion things in it. I'm never going to erase it. I'm like, that's fine. And honestly, I let mine accumulate too sometimes where it will get to 400, 500 messages. But as long as I know that like every week or so, I'm going to process that to zero, I'm not stressed by it. So I think the same thing can be said for your desk. If you know that even monthly, you're going to deal with everything on there and that you're not going to get in trouble by leaving every, anything in there till the end of the month, then I think it's fine. But if it's completely undefined and it stresses you out because you don't know if that paper was like, a you know, again, like some prescription for a patient that needed to be signed, then you probably need to, to create a ritual around dealing with the stuff. Thank you for giving me permission to keep my messy desk messy. You're welcome. Because, <laughs> yeah, because none of that stuff, at least in my situation, is is anything pressing. Otherwise, it stays on the top until until it's addressed or I can't go home until until it's addressed. I, I guess I, I have a system. It's, it's a messy system. I, I could improve it, clearly. Okay, so... Do you want to go into how you can organize your how how you organize your day? Because I think you covered like macro goals for the year down to the quarter. But what about like you wake up in the morning and you know how how do you how do you know especially with three kids and a, and a husband works how that gets done yeah. in an organized way? Well, I definitely wake up before the kids often, not always before my husband, actually, he often is an early, I'll see him on Epic at like 4.30 in the morning. Yay. (laughs) Our lives are so fun. But no, I, I get up before the kids and, or I try to, not always on the weekends, but at least on the weekdays. And I look at my weekly calendar to see like, what do I have that day? I'll often pull up Haiku on my phone, which is like, you know, the mobile Epic to see like how many patients I have that day if it's a clinical day. And then I'll sit there and just kind of like write a little timeline of like what I think I'm, going to get done in terms of like other stuff, if there's stuff outside of patients. And sometimes it's a day where I'm not going to get stuff done, but somehow looking at everything I have to do and even knowing like, you know what, today's a patient day and really all I'm going to do is see patients, come home, put the kids to bed and relax. It, I feel much better about that day, having looked at the week's landscape, looked at my to-dos and like made the conscious decision not to do stuff. So that's what I'll do like on a busy patient day. If it's more of a, I'm a program director. So my time is basically like half patient stuff, half GME stuff, and then 10% being home and unpaid and podcasting. Um, but if it's a GME day, then I more look at kind of my big long-term stuff and I decide like, well, what do I need to get done today? Do I need to do our rank list? Do I need to meet with the resident? Do I, or maybe that's already on my calendar. Like I kind of just like figure out what my big rocks are for the day career-wise and also family-wise if there's anything that applies. Like maybe today, for example, I had a parent-teacher conference. So I knew I couldn't plan to do much else that morning. I couldn't work out. So I worked out later, which is why you see me like not wearing proper work attire at this moment, but I'm home. So it's okay. Yeah. So I, I really do take at least 10 minutes, I would say, to put together the day's landscapes figure out what my goals are going to be because then that really helps set me on a good trajectory for the rest of the day. And when I'm on as an inpatient covering doctor, I take that same thing. And once I get to work, I'm really meticulous about writing down the order of like the consults and the follow-ups that I'm going to see. And I find that I tend to be a lot more efficient than some of my colleagues who kind of go over with a printed list and like they're going in every which direction. And it's like, okay, take the time to actually put out the fires that are fires so that you're not being interrupted while you're in rooms that don't have urgent stuff. And it really seems to pay off dividends in getting my stuff done. So I have more time to do my notes and teach my residents and and everything else. Yeah, I uh, that's something that I wasn't great at as a resident because I didn't have a system. But right? I think it's important for residents, right? Because they're they have enormously long lists of things to do. So what do you do? What's the first thing? Just like when the team breaks and it seems like everybody's running a different direction and rushing to get stuff done, just take the time to take your list, make a make it a you know triage it. What are the priorities? Figure out the order that things need to get done, and then do it. And it's you know it's going to take a couple minutes to do that, but it's worth it. 
I think residency was when I truly began to embrace the checkbox. <laughs> you know, those patient lists that we'd, we'd print out and then have like 8 million checkbox. And I think I had like different colored checkbox that meant like, you know, different levels of urgency. <laughs> I um, knew those residents. I wasn't yeah. that resident, but I knew those residents. I, I wasn't. It, it seemed to, it helped my sanity at least. <laughs> I don't know about anything else, but it helped me figure out, it, you know, I could see a light at, light at the end of every, every, every day's task list and it helped my sanity and probably help my productivity to some extent as well. So for our physician audience out there, is there anything else that you think we haven't touched on that you think would help them become more organized in their personal and professional lives? Yeah, don't be afraid to go back to the basics and try new things when it comes to calendaring. I think that so much of organization does tend to come down to managing your time and intentionally planning out your time. I think that uh, simple planning tools can have a lot of power, even silly things like I know a physician who prints out her weekly Google calendar and then writes lists on that. I'm like, that's so simple, but it's genius. And I think that even though you may feel like, you know, it's about sharpening your knives before you start cutting, right? Like you may not feel like you have the time that it takes to plan out your day and it may seem silly, but I urge you to try it because I think many times it will pay off in dividend. Are there any apps? I know you're you're all on paper, you've got these, your, your books, but are there any apps out there that either you've heard other people talk about that that help them to get organized? Yeah. Uh, I don't, there aren't any affiliate links for if go <laughs> I to the show notes. I don't have affiliate links, no. Yeah. But I mean, I think Google Calendar is a huge one and you can actually store a lot of information in Google Calendar as well. You don't have to use it just for calendaring. I know a lot of people really like the app Todoist, which allows you to collect to-do lists, but um, there's no one right a way. Todoist? Todoist, T-O-D-O-I-S-T, Todoist. Oh, so take yeah. out the L from to-do list, okay. Yes, exactly. So that's like basically an app that allows you to keep a bunch of lists separate. Okay, and what was the Cozy app? C-O-Z-I. So that's kind of one that's especially targeted, I think, towards parents that are trying to, it, not necessarily working parents, but it could absolutely work for working parents that are trying to kind of integrate home stuff and communicating with a partner and you could put work stuff in there as well. Any any others? Or you think to do it between Todoist and Cozy and Google Calendar, we got it all covered? Well, I don't know if we got it all covered because I can't say that I'm as much of an expert in the digital sphere, but I think, I think Google Calendar... And a planner, I think those two are pretty darn powerful when when put together. I also, most people probably know this and are already doing this, but if you have an iPhone, the Apple Calendar app, you can pull your Outlook calendars and your Google calendars and it will put them all together so you can see all of them in one place. So that way, you know, I can see my husband's date night, but I can also see resident noon conference, but he doesn't have to see resident noon conference. So you can pick um, and choose which, which, what gets shared and what doesn't get shared. Correct, correct. And it can integrate calendars from multiple sources, which is really helpful. So where can people find you online and where can people find your podcast? Yeah, so I uh, have an old-fashioned blog that is pretty, you know, the old school diary blogs that don't exist anymore. I still write one of those. I've written it since 2004 and you can find it at theshoebox.com, T-H-E-S-H-U-B-O-X.com. And then I do co-host a podcast with Laura Vanderkam called Best of Both Worlds. And you can find us on any of the podcast apps. It's about making work and life fit together. It's especially for women, but we have fathers that listen as well. And um, yeah, we have more than 130 episodes. So feel free to peruse the archives. Binge listen on your long commutes. Yes. And uh, links to all of that will be in the show notes. Sarah Hartunger, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.